Well, good afternoon on my part, and uh, I'd like to, to very much thank the organisers, the joint organisers uh, of this symposium. I think it's a, an excellent initiative. Uh, it's, it's very nice uh, for me to see so many people coming here from not only from, from, the, from the court itself, but also um, from further afield, both uh, the practitioner and the, and the academic element. And I think this uh, conception of having a dialogue uh, of this kind, um, focusing in on, on specific questions which are of both academic and practical interest is, is, a, is a really good one. So I, I really welcome the initiative and, and I was very honored to be asked to, to chair this session. Um, so we've had one session which I think was a fascinating discussion on uh, international dispute settlement. Um, this second session, as you know, will focus on the relationship between um, EU law and agreements concluded by the member states. Uh, and I think it's one of the, we were talking earlier, weren't we, about the specificities of the European Union, the fact it's not a state, um, its particular um, character as an international actor. And one of those, um, one aspect of that characteristic, which we touched on already when we were talking, for example, about international responsibility, is the fact that um, the union is operating alongside its member states internationally, and they retain the ability to uh, conclude treaties. They have a very rich treaty practice of their own, both uh, going back to prior even to the formation of the European Union or their accession to the European Union, um, but also continuing. And I, I think it's a, it is a defining characteristic of the EU and the, the nature of the EU as an international actor. Um, the, and I think that one of, the, one of the most interesting aspects of that is the way in which the, the European Union, on the one hand, and the member states on the other, how, how, the, how the EU sits, if you like, um, alongside other international regimes um, of, of many different kinds that would include the law of the sea regime, but also the Convention on Human Rights, but also private international law regimes. And this, um, this way in which the European Union legal order sits alongside other international regimes which the member states themselves are, um, are part of is, is, I think, one of, the, one of the aspects of the question that we're going to um, discuss uh, this afternoon. It's a, it's a very, it's a huge topic um, and uh, it covers a very wide variety, of course, different possible questions we could, we could look at. And I think our speakers are going to be uh, selective as to what, what they're going to focus on, but we could be looking at um, the, the joint participation of the EU and member states in international agreements involving the scope of interpretation um, of the, the court's jurisdiction to interpret the agreement, the operation, how the duty of uh, cooperation operates in the context of, of mixed agreements, how ongoing decision-making operates in the context of mixed agreements, for example. Um, we could uh, also look at questions of, if you like, what, what notice can EU law take of member state agreements that are not mixed agreements, ag agreements to which the member states are parties but the EU is not. Quest to what extent might those, would they ever be binding? Functional succession is very limited but questions of compatibility, how we handle um, the mechanisms for making links, legal links, between EU law on the one hand and member state agreements on the other. Um, so I think there's a whole, there's a whole range of issues which, uh, which come to mind when we um, look at the question of member state agreements on the one hand and EU law on the other. Um, and we're not going to be able to cover all of them, but uh, we get, I, I hope what we will do is, is draw out some of the, uh, some, some of, some of the m more um, structural questions or thematic questions, if you like, that, that, that arise from, 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 those, from those different questions. And in particular, uh, to think a little bit about how the European Union, um, as I said, sits alongside other types of international regime. Um, 
Okay, so without more ado, you're not here to listen to me, but to listen to the speakers of the panel. So I'm going to hand over straight away to uh, Professor Katja Ziegler. Thank you. Thank you, and also for me a very, uh, very heartfelt thanks to uh, inviting me, and it's a pleasure to be here. Um, my to uh, uh, well, the topic uh, of my talk is the relationship between EU law and the agreements concluded by the member states. And uh, as Marie mentioned, this is a vast topic and I cannot cover everything, so I opted for a broad identification of trends which bear certain risk because it, the t paper will be at a certain, uh, at a, a relatively general level. Um, the topic is also complex international, uh, the foreign relations law of the, of the EU. The subject matter is complex anywhere. We have additional complications in the EU because of the expansion and the fluid nature of competences. And playing out in this is often, or uh, almost always, uh, a tension between multipolar interests, not just between states and the EU, but in particular also within the EU, between the Commission and the Council in particular, I do not dare to speak here about the court, I leave that to others, but the, the tension between um, states and uh, the EU plays out internally in the EU as well, and that is an added complication. Um, treaties themselves but are, are complex beasts, and I just because I will go into much more general air, um, comments. But if we think of a typology of treaties, we can sort them by competences, exclusive, shared, uh, and, me uh, and member states only. However, that never maps on actual uh, on the actual treaty realities. Yeah, to parties involved is perhaps a more uh, straightforward way forward. So we have treaties concluded only by the member states and um, mixed treaties between member states and, um, and, uh, and the EU concluded together. And the EU only. In each category, we need to distinguish further between bilateral and multilateral. And with the member states only treaties, we further need to dist uh, distinguish between pre-accession or pre-EU treaty treaties and post-accession treaties. And, and I finished the typology with a final hint here. We can also sort the treaties by effect of the treaty within EU law. And Judge Alan Rosas very helpfully provided a, 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 a typology, a sliding scale in this context, ranging from full in effect internally, for example, by a direct effect, to no effect, and a whole range of categories in between interpretive effect or more, more looser, looser taking into account. So I will, this is kind of my preface. Against that backdrop, I, I, I would like to talk more in this uh, afternoon session about um, two trends in EU law. And my task got just a little bit easier because uh, Pete Eckhut already covered some of the first trend. The first trend is a, a, a trend of greater restrictiveness uh, of the EU legal order towards international law. So it concerns the effect of treaties or also international law more generally in the EU legal order and the diminishing effect of treaties. But that, there's a second trend and that is one of growing impact, growing influence of the EU externally going along with the growing impact of the EU on uh, member states treaties. So there is a discrepancy between the two trends. And just I will, uh, against this uh, background, proceed further by briefly talking about the effects of international law and treat, uh, in particular treaties in EU law and the restrictive trend, then turn around to look at the effects of EU law and member states treaties, and then go a little bit in, more into the practicalities. Why can EU law be a problem for other states, parties to treaties concluded by the member states or international organizations as such, and then very, very tentatively, uh, because I do not want to be totally 
destructive. I'd like to make some constructive remarks at the end uh, in favor of an alternative or elements of an alternative approach. Yeah, that's not a theory, that is really just elements. So as Pete uh, Eckwood has already uh, talked us through a little bit. Yeah, the, um, the, the trend of a greater restrictiveness of the EU legal order can be kind of uh, sketched out from an initially m historically more open approach alongside um, a more international law oriented paradigm paradigm of um, of the EU legal order. But around 2008-2009, the EU legal order became more restrictive, and this coincides with the coming into, well, with the Treaty of Lisbon appearing uh, on the horizon, but also three cases, uh, um, Fiam and Fedom, Intertanko, and the Cardi case. Um, and the, 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 case, the line of cases has since continued. The, these cases are characterized by uh, making it more difficult for international law and treaty law in particular to have direct effect in the EU legal order by reducing the amount of interpretation or the, e, the likelihood of interpretation in conformity with international law and in, in relation to the European Convention of Human Rights. Um, a sub, the substantive references to the ECHR rights have reduced, and that's of course uh, understandable in the light of the Charter of Fundamental Rights, but it is also part of that, uh, that general trend, and perhaps it's also not so understandable given that the ECHR could quite uh, dramatically guide the interpretation of the Charter as a completely new instrument re re requiring interpretation. But this trend culminated, and I'll be brief here, in Opinion 213, which um, went beyond the Cardi case in, uh, 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 in that it elevated, let's say, the untouchable core of a EU law beyond really an untouchable core. Yeah? Whereas Cardi can be interpreted still as um, uh, uh, prior, prior, prioritizing core constitutional principles over uh, other international law. Uh, um, the opinion 213 goes beyond that. And it is also a very good example of the various interests at stake in EU external relation law because the, the thread that is running through opinion 13 to my mind is, is uh, the distrust and the tension um, with a, towards the member states, the distrust towards the member states in um, using the um, accession to the ECHR as a tool to challenge the, the supremacy of EU law. So, to, so mo moving on from the restrictive ten trend towards international law in the EU legal order to the effects of EU law on member states' treaties. And uh, I, there, there are a whole host of issues. I'm just focusing on two. And one is, the first one is the impact um, of EU law on, sta on member states as, as, sta uh, as, uh, as parties to international treaties. So it affecting their status as to um, joining, <laughs> continuing to, to be a party, and um, perhaps even ultimately requiring them to conclude treaties. The second uh, dimension is the impact of EU law on the operation of treaty regimes and international organizations as such. And I'm, I just want to mention three legal principles which are at the heart of many of the, the effects on member states' treaties, because I cannot in each scenario go through the, the legal detail. But obviously the allocation of competences uh, between the EU and the member states and the gaining of more exclusive competences of the EU is at the heart of some of the effects. And Relatedly, but also separately, the principle of sincere cooperation requiring member states increasingly to act in certain ways or to abstain from action in relation to, um, to, uh, to uh, treaties is, uh, is uh, a very pro features very prominently in these situations on um, 
uh, uh, on showing the effect of EU law on uh, treaties. And last but not least, um, um, the, uh, the interpretation of Article uh, uh, 351 dealing with uh, pre-accession treaties also uh, 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 pervades the, uh, these scenarios. So if I turn to the, the, um, the three scenarios which show the impact on the status of the uh, as parties to the treaties, or the impact of EU law on the status of as parties to the treaties. Um, so the so the, there are three, the, the question to become a party, the, so to conclude a treaty, to remain a party, uh, and the potential issue even to have a, uh, and be under a duty to conclude a treaty under EU law. So conclusion of treaties, the, the, the logical com uh, consequence of exclusive competence is that member states have to abstain, abstain from concluding a treaty. But beyond that, uh, due to the principle of, of, of um, sincere cooperation, member states are on, on the similar, almost at times similarly far-reaching duties to abstain, which uh, to abstain from participating, or at least uh, delay participation. And uh, uh, th this is rooted in the IMO and the FOSS case and the um, OIV case law. And I say a little bit about some of these and uh, further along. But just to make that uh, uh, basically more more vi uh, more visual, yeah. The an example where um, member states had to abstain for abstain for reasons of substantive regular competence is the um, uh, foreign fighters protocol, which is on, uh, under consideration under well, which has been signed in, in the. Um, uh, in, in the context of the Council of Europe, but after the Paris attack last, attacks last uh, November, the, um, the EU also started its own um, uh, legislative process, starting with a, uh, announcing the proposal of a directive, and that means member states have to abstain from continuing further down the line with the ratification process of the Council of Europe Foreign Fighters Protocol, and this is a, a, a prime example for a delay caused by by uh, EU law in this context, in a situation where perhaps cooperation, in particular, also with uh, non-EU member states, is very important. Um, there's also so this is for substantive reasons of exercise of uh, EU competence, but there may also be duties to wait for proceed for simply for procedural reasons, and that is very much. Uh, relevant in the context of mixed agreements. Yeah, the, it is practice in order to avoid partial mixity um, so that there's an asymmetry between EU member states and the EU being party to the treaties that um, um, ratification happens by hybrid act simultaneously in the council, which, which means the slowest link basically drives the timeline. So one member state so not, not necessarily the EU can block, but one, one member state uh, can block the whole ratification process, and that is currently the case with the Council of Europe Convention on the Manipulation of Sports Competition, which aims to um, uh, uh, prevent match, uh, um, fraud with regard to um, match fixing. So one EU member state or the EU itself can uh, delay or prevent ratification because of the principle of sincere cooperation that underlies that, that practice. Um, second constellation, remaining a party to a treaty or denunciation. So we are, the, it's in the nature of EU competence that it moves, although not necessarily in one direction, but um, um, in situations where, where states have concluded treaties and the EU subsequently acquires exclusive competence, there's a question whether these states, the member states, then need to denounce the treaty. So uh, that plays out in two dimensions. In bilateral treaties, as most, uh, we have actually a um, a, a conflict law norm, but only for the pre-accession treaties. There's a temporary protection at best and potentially no protection in the, if the conditions of Article 351, uh, Paragraph 2, are interpreted very widely. Um, the, the problem here with 
want to just drop in is the lack of clarity of the criteria, the broad interpretation leading to a lack of clarity of the, the criteria of Article 351, leading even to a reversal of the, the rule exception paradigm of between paragraph one and paragraph two. Um, the, the second dimension is the multilateral one. I think that's even more problematic if through a subsequent acquisition of exclusive competence, member states will need, are required to denounce a treaty. Uh, the practice there, probably because of the nature of multilateral dynamics, is not as consistent as with bilateral treaties. Um, so there's a mixture between toleration of continued member state presence, authorization of member states to remain present in the treaty, or requirement <laughs> to denounce. And this was uh, an example for the latter is the um, Convention, the con also Council of Europe Convention on the con uh, Legal Protection of Services based on or consisting of conditional access, is basically uh, media services you, you pay for. Uh, here uh, um, we had a situation that the convention was signed and ratified by a number of member states. Uh, uh, followed by a court of justice ruling, finding exclusive competence, and then a request by the uh, commission to denounce the treaty, which was followed by some member states, but not by all. So, and it's unclear where, where, where this convention will go and also where, what happens to uh, the states that, uh, that did not denounce. Um, and I don't want to spend much time on the last uh, issue, but if member states membership to a treaty is governed by EU law, the logical extension would be that member states could also be required to uh, conclude treaties. Um, and um, this, is, this hasn't happened yet. Yeah, one could imagine that when um, the EU cannot become a party in an area of exclusive competence that in such a scenario it could require member states to become a party or uh, in order to exercise a certain number of voting rights, which in treaties is frequently tied to the number of member states' parties to the treaty, or perhaps for procedural reasons, um, to prevent that uh, scenario of one member state to be able to block uh, uh, the, the, the simultaneous ratification. Um, the, the closest we, we, we are for, to the scenario is currently a request uh, uh, from the Commission um, and, and, uh, co coupled with an authorization for the member states to sign the Mauritius Convention on Transparency, which is a tool for um, the Commission to uh, align member states' uh, bilateral investment treaty with the EU policy on transparency. Yeah, the, the member states' treat treaties, which are prior to 2014, um, do not come under the, the EU uh, transparency rules. So that could go further, uh, rest restrict further the member states' freedom to conclude treaties. Um, okay, some questions that I just want to raise. I ho hope uh, they can be picked up in the discussion. So the question that this, these, uh, this impact of EU law raises is, is it relevant for, for whatever reasons to keep states, member states as parties to the treaty even where the EU acquires exclusive competences. One could say there's a very practical reason for that, namely the fluid nature of EU competences, and I'm not being cynical here, I try to avoid the B word, but Brexit shows that it's not unheard of. Um, but also it's in the, in the logic of a, the better regulation agenda in the EU that competences could also roll back. So in this uh, scenario, we, it would not be impossible to conceive that that uh, member states' uh, continued present and presence as parties in the treaty regime can be uh, beneficial. Um, there, there 
there may be legal reasons, and here's more the perspective from international law, and that uh, plays to the member state or the state's role in international law making. And this is not just treaty making, but also making of customary international law. And there's a link between the two, as treaties can evidence, but also develop uh, and contribute to customary law. Now, if the states are er eradicated or, uh, uh, from the treaty regime, then that may have a wider impact on general international law. So as a response, therefore, in contrast to what is the, the kind of logic reflex with exclusive competence, I think I, I would rather see mixity as the way forward, even though it causes a different uh, set of, of problems. Um, <coughs> And moving on from this uh, to um, the impact of uh, EU law on the operation and implementation of treaties. Now, the, the legal principles underlying these effects are very much the same um, competence, sincere cooperation, and um, yeah, at least two mainly. Um, member states are, in, when they are acting in treaty frameworks, and this is in any kind of competence, and their duties to, co to refrain from actions potentially under uh, sincere cooperation or to coordinate uh, positions. And uh, I, I just want to uh, highlight the case of uh, FOSS, where, um, uh, where Sweden wanted to, to list a certain chemical to be prohibited in, um, in, in, in um, in, in, in the context of uh, environmental regulation. And it, it, it uh, did not get a position in the EU context that this, uh, the, the EU wanted to propose the, or support the listing of that chemical. But it's, um, and subsequently the, the court held that um, basically Sweden breached its obligations by, uh, by proposing the listing of, of that chemical without an EU decision. Now, uh, it's, it, the case highlights very well that, that uh, the problems ar around the wide um, interpretation of the principle of sincere cooperation, what are the duties linked to it, when do they kick in, when does a, a community or when does a union policy start, when is, uh, I think in this case it was really unclear whether the EU had decided um, not to decide on the issue, or whether it took a negative decision not to list. And these fine lines are decisive on whether there are duties and, uh, of cooperation or not. Um, I just want to highlight a fairly recent case of, of I think, end of 2014, the OIV case, where um, basically this dealt with a kind of specialized duty of cooperation under uh, Article 218, Paragraph 9 of the treaty, which requires uh, that uh, legally binding acts of, tr uh, that, the, that, the, uh, that um, uh, a co coordinated position needs to be sought if uh, a treaty body passes a, or adopts a legally binding act. And um, the, uh, the court in this case took a very broad approach. Yeah, the uh, um, Advocate General Cruz Villalon, I think, in my opinion, um, adopted an, a very impeccable interpretation of the of the treaty. But um, nevertheless, even though the EU is not a party to the treaty, it uh, 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 the, the court required a. Um, a, a, a coordinated position in this context. And this shows one uh, effect ver uh, very much, which I think is not just relevant in this case law, but the possibility of the, the EU to pick and choose. Whether it's a party or not, it can exercise influence over uh, a treaty, um, either through the member states or directly. And. Um, the, I, I can't go into detail here, but uh, uh, the, the, the case also adopts a very broad uh, interpretation of a legally binding act. Uh, it may be that because the, the, the context falls in the exclusive um, uh, uh, um, competence agricultural policy, that the case is like not representative of what's to come, but it, it is 
certainly an example for why far-reaching duties to coordinate under this specialist uh, rule. Um, and I think I've already covered this. So why, and I think it has already emerged from the examples I gave, why EU law can be a problem for international treaties. There are practical reasons. The lack of clarity of the interpretation of some of the principles <coughs> governing the relationship between the EU and the member states. Delay and link to that, if member states do not um, ratify a treaty, that may affect the, the entry into force of the treaty if there are certain quora that need to be reached. Then there are political reasons. Um, yeah, there's uh, the EU states, now 27 states, are acting as a block that has an effect on, on other parties. This is perhaps less prominent in a, in a universal context, in the context of universal treaties, but in a regional context, and um, this is particularly the, the relevant for the Council of Europe, 27 out of 47, this can lead to a marginalization of um, of plenty, uh, 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 marginalization of the other parties who might need, be needed to tackle a certain problem. Then there's a, an, an increasingly also an overlap between EU legislation and treaties, at, at least in a regional context, which means that standards cannot be set as, as freely and um, in, in the international treaty context. Now, from, from the perspective of international law, um, there's a problem with uh, a strong constitutional approach because it could set a bad example of breaching international law in the worst case. It, uh, as, as outlined, it has an impact on states as primary subjects of international law and their capacity to conclude treaties, and there's an effect on uh, on the na uh, um, nature of international lawmaking, which I think needs to be brought much more into the consciousness that uh, in, also in an EU law context, we're moving in the context of international law. International law is particularly vulnerable to breaches and particularly depending on a um, affirmation through practice. And um, so, um, practice that uh, or breaches that go uncontested uh, are problematic from, from that perspective. And here I come to my, I think, last two slides, a tentative alternative approach is uh, uh, one that o more openly engages with international law and tries where, where possible not to bypass conflicts or to leave, to shut them out of the legal order, but to address them and um, that uh, does not necessarily mean that all conflicts need to be avoided. Core constitutional principles uh, may be a break, I would acknowledge this, but if such a conflict is unavoidable, it can still be softened by a um, by an engagement with, with, international, with international law rules, for example, parallel human rights rules uh, that exist in the international legal order. And um, this, uh, this means not just engagement of EU law, of the EU legal order and international law within the EU legal order, the first trend, but also engagement of the EU through participation in the international legal order. So I think it's not acceptable that the, that the EU stays on the sideline in the cases where uh, it is actually possible to, to join treaty regimes. Yeah, in that sense, it should take the constitutional paradigm seriously and go, go all the way in this context. But it also should uh, be conscious of its roots and, and carry forward also the international law paradigm. So in a truly sui generis sense, taking account of the sui generis nature of the EU and, for example, accept mixity of, of uh, treaty regimes, even in, in, uh, in the context of exclusive uh, competences. Um, 
yeah, this in, in a technical way, in my view, that would require to to revisit some overly strict interpretations and to refine the duty of sincere cooperation, uh, the conditions uh, for. Um, uh, uh, the conflict through with, with pre-existing, in regard to pre-existing treaties, and also if OIV is going to stand uh, article two, uh, the, the, the need for uh, the interpretation of the requirement for coordinated positions in the article 218. Now, this sounds all very negative. What's in for the EU, I think, is uh, the uniqueness of this dual basis, of its uh, sui generis nature, both half, half constitutional, half international, can also be an opportunity to uh, enhance its legitimacy and perhaps even through that the acceptance of EU law in the, in the member states. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Instead of starting with the usual introducing words uh, as uh, expressing my deep gratitude and my great honor, I would prefer to confess something. <laughs> uh, quite sincerely, I feel a little bit at unease. Why? Because it's not that easy task to present something concerning the case law of our court, and this is, of course, the aim of our conference, to create a dialogue between the academy and the judiciary, without or being very boring, or uh, reveal the secrets of deliberation, or to tell something everybody knows. <laughs> and of course, I know that there are several among you who know our judgments better than we do. Uh, sometimes even they find in our judgment something which was at least not intended to be expressed, but perhaps the wording it says another thing. So what should I do? Uh, to list a long, a big number of our judgments? No. Uh, you, you know them, and it won't be interesting. Uh, to, to be a judge, and in my breast, uh, a professor's heart is still beating, uh, don't forget this, uh, is not that easy and not that agreeable as some of, the, of you may think. You can't say everything you would like to. And my colleagues here in the room will, I hope, agree. Huh? Sometimes you must talk about judgments where you even participated, but it's not necessary that you like it. You may disagree with it, you may have stayed in minority, and still, it's your judgment. So I'll do my best not to bother you with reproducing certain judgments of our court, but to try to indicate to you what is perhaps the meaning of a certain decision. Uh, and as we have been listening all the afternoon today that our judgments in the external relations of the EU matters are not always very easy to reach. Uh, I'll, with your permission, quote some questions which appear in the doctrine concerning our court in, and its case law in this field. I quote from a book, a recent one, edited by my neighbor here on the left, uh, where the first three, three chapters start with questions. The Court of Justice of the European Union, is it first 
reticent, second, selfish, and third, powerless. I'm not going to answer, at least <laughs> at the beginning. So let me limit, as the program says, to the Court of Justice and the international agreements of the member states alone, the only member states' agreements. The jurisprudence is abundant. Uh, but what is it about? Is, are these agreements part of the European law, the law, European Union? Not at all, of course. We don't speak about mixed agreements and the EU agreements, but of the purely national agreements. So they are a part of national law. And does our court have a competence to interpret national law? Of course, no. You can find this answer in every textbook, in every manual concerning European law. So we, we must avoid it. And we write it in our judgments very often. It's a standard formula. The court is not uh, competent or will not interpret the national law. So what do we have with this kind of agreements? It has the same situation as the other rules of the national law. OK, we are not asked to interpret it. Do we apply it? I won't, wouldn't like to enter here in the very known dilemma, what is the difference between interpreting a, a rule and applying it. it it's, the, the, the borderline is difficult to find. So what do we do with the, this type of agreements? The same as with the national law. We just assess that it exists, but we don't interpret it. It, it is not uh, quite clear what does it mean, but that's, that's it. So let's see. I, uh, but the national agreements exist, national international agreements exist, and as Professor Ziegler just said, the member states are used to them. There is a long tradition. There, are, there is an immense number of such agreements, so the existence of them is here and will still be here especially the agreements, not the bilateral ones, but the multilateral ones with third countries, especially those who create international organizations. And this is the fact. We must bear it in mind. Uh, by the way, uh, we in, in Europe, we sometimes forget that there is a small piece of world also outside Europe. And we, we can't live with this, with this. So I limit myself to two cases. I had more, but having in mind the, the time, I limit myself to two. Uh, concerning the interaction between the EU law and international member only, member states only agreements in two special fields. Uh, I must explain that in my former life I was professor of private international transport and intellectual property law, so it will be uh, reflected in my choice. I apologize, but every choice is a little bit subjective and not necessarily uh, loved by everybody. So we have two cases, quite recent ones, one is from this year, uh, which af affect the relationship between the rules of the European Union secondary law concerning the international competence and recognition and execution of uh, foreign judgments on one side, and on the other side, national um, agreements concerning transport and 
intellectual property. Of course, you know what I'm speaking about, talking about the rules of the European Union uh, concerning the international competence. Uh, I speak about the rules concerning uh, rules known as Brussels Convention, afterwards Brussels Regulation 1, and afterwards Brussels Regulation 1A or RICAST, or how can we uh, name it? This development from Brussels Convention to Brussels Regulation is often called, uh, it's hard to pronounce this word, Amsterdamization of the Brussels Convention, because it was Treaty of Amsterdam which allowed this transfer of competence that the Union, the communities at the time, uh, become competent, got the, the exclusive competence concerning this field of law. So now we have a complete obligatory regulation in this field. But before, a lot of international conventions existed concerning also containing also the rules uh, on international competence. And uh, one of these international competence conventions is, was and is, the um, Geneva Conventions 456, so the, uh, the Convention Internationale sur le contrat de transport international des marchandises par route, popularly known as CMR Convention, which in its Article 31 uh, provides the international competence and the problem of lease pendants in another, in a court of a certain country. The case I'm going to talk about is, you would know it, the TNT Netherlands, the TNT Netherlands, uh, great chamber of our court, from 2010. There were a lot of commentaries in the doctrine concerning this judgment, and I won't uh, enter into details. I'll just try to explain what could be its meaning. It's not, I'm not speaking in, with my authority of a judge or a chamber of the court, of course. Uh, the story is very simple. It is really not a very big case as to facts and to the money involved. And so it happens often to our court, you know. It's not uh, the hard cases make bad law, but it is usually the, the contrary. Huh? Bad cases or small cases make good law. And if, if you remember well, all, some or a lot of very famous judgments of our court were based on a small dispute somewhere in Europe, like Costa Enel or Cimental or Manhent Elos and, and, and so on. There, nobody rem even remembers what was it about, because it's the result, the, the juridical logic, which is important, but not the, the case itself. And here was a, a transport a litigation between a German and a Dutch company, Dutch company presented by the insurance company, and there was a, a forum shopping uh, case because the Dutch company, the TNT, asked from the Dutch court uh, a negative declaratory judgment that it is not responsible for more than the limit of, of of responsibility under the CMR conventions. The transport is a very illustrative case because the rules adapted for the world transportation and sometimes very old are, have some specific uh, features. And the problem was whether in this case the CMR rules are to be applied or the Brussels one regulation, and I just to be to make it more clear, 
quote the two articles, but very shortly. Article 71 of the regulations says, these regulations shall not affect any conventions to which the member state are parties and to which in relation to particular matters govern jurisdiction or the recognition or enforcement of judgments. And then, paragraph two or section two, this regulation shall not prevent a court of a member state which is a party to a convention on a particular matter from assuming jurisdiction in accordance with that convention even where the defendant is domiciled in another member state which is a not par party of that convention, and so on and so on. It's quite a long, it's a long uh, article. And then the CMR Convention 31, um, in legal proceedings arising out of carriage under this convention, the plaintiff may bring an action in any court or tribunal of a contracting uh, country to, within whose territory the defendant is ordinarily resident or has his principal place of business, and so on. And second, where in respect of a claim referred to in paragraph one of this article, an action is pending before courts or tribunal competent under that paragraph, or where in respect of such a claim, a judgment has been entered by such a court or tribunal, no new action shall be started between the same parties, and so on. So this was the question. And the question, uh, the pre reference for premier rule from the Hague Court, or from the Hoheratia, from the Netherlands Supreme Court, uh, is again very long and asks our court to interpret, if I shorten a little bit, the relationship between the two articles, 31 of the CMR and the 71 of the Brussels. Uh, regulation. And after a long explanation, our court decided. I, I would not appreciate whether the result is the, the, a good one or not. Or not. Nemo situdex in propria causa. But it did. It decided as to the relationship between the two. In a case such as the main proceedings, the rules governing jurisdiction, recognition, and enforcement that are laid down by a specialized convention, such as the lease pendants rule set out in Article 31 of the CMR, and the rule relating to enforceability set out in Article 31.3 of that convention, apply in principle, provided that they are highly predictable facilitate the sound administration of justice and enable the risk of concurrent proceedings to be minimized and that they ensure under conditions at least as favorable as those provided for, the, for by the regulation, the free movement of judgments in civil and commercial matters and so on. And in the brackets, we put down favor executionis. So we said, yes, the convention, member-only convention, is applicable, but under condition, and the condition is, of course, very, a very strong one. You must respect the uh, intention of the Brussels regulation. So uh, the, uh, the court uh, must, of course, respect this orientation. Uh, so, the rules of EU law, in fact, prevail. And it affected a, a convention which has been concluded before uh, the Brussels regulation. Now, the other one, and I'll finish with, with this, would will per perhaps be less, less acceptable or not. <coughs> the judgment in the case Bright Strike Technologies from 14th of July of this year. It's really a, <coughs> a recent one. In this case, intellectual property, the question 
arose again a Dutch court. Dutch courts are, as you know, good clients of our court. Uh, the, the court in The Hague, whether the competence in a case when it's a family case, huh? because the plaintiff is Bright Strike Technologies Incorporated, a US company, and the defendant is Bright Strike Technologies Societe Anonyme, a, a, a company from Luxembourg. Uh, the question was whether the Benelux Convention on intellectual property applies or the Brussels one regulation. The Brussels, the Benelux Convention is posterior to the Brussels one convention. Yes, it succeeded, the Benelux Convention, uh, loi uniforme de Benelux, uh, uniform law of Benelux, treating the same uh, the same matter, but it was formally and also as to the legal nature different. So the court, of course, applied directly the rule that later conventions should could not prevail to the regulation. It's a long exp explanation in in the judgment, which is. Which is a little bit didactic one. Uh, but at the end, and of course, the, the solution would be quite different, uh, whether one or the other system of rules is applicable. The Brussels one regulations uh, provides the, the competence of the court of the place where the trademark had been registered and the 4.6 of uh, article of the Benelux Convention uh, provides the different uh, other possibilities, a cascade um, competence, but it says directly, it's, it's very uh, interesting to to read it, the place in which the trademark or design is filed or registered shall not under any circumstances be used as the sole basis for determining territorial jurisdiction. So it's clearly opposite. It clearly excludes the competence provided in the Brussels regulations. Of course, it, or it's A or B, tertium non datur. And the court, of course, said that the later convention can't influence the applicability of the regulation, but, and it explains, so it's clear, it's prohibited to, for a national court to apply a later convention. But of course, the, the final result was contrary, having in mind, in mind the, the Article 350 of the TF. EU concerning the special juridical status of Benelux countries. There, the, the, the article says it is allowed, I, I simplify a little bit, if it, it's not contrary to the, uh, the objectives of these regional unions are not attained by application of the treaties. And now the court explains that it's not contrary because it would be, it's similar to the regulation on trade, trademarks, which provides for competence, international competence, excluding the place of uh, where the trademarks were registered, because if this would be allowed, the Alicante court would be exclusively competent for the trademarks for the European, European Union trademark. So it, it has, of course, no sense. That's it. And uh, uh, the comment would, could be, uh, could be um, longer. You'll also find out that the opinion of the general advocate, 
my friend uh, here present was not quite identical, but which happens very often in, in our court, but it was extremely um, useful. So I came to, to the end. And now, <laughs> can we, after these examples, which are perhaps not the most uh, appropriate ones, answer to the question initially mentioned? The court is what? Reticent? Mm -hmm. Selfish? Powerless? I leave the answers to you. <laughs> Thank you. So, thank you very much to both our speakers. Let me open the floor. We've got uh, about 25 minutes for questions, discussion. Please. Thank you. Fernando Castillo from the European Commission. Uh, I was getting a bit depressed with the presentation on the slides, to be honest, because there was a point in time there was a slide about the problems of EU participating in international treaties. I didn't see any corresponding slide about the benefits of the EU participating in international treaties. It appears it's all problems. Uh, one could imagine plenty of benefits. Huh? I, I know the area of trade and fisheries, for example, where the EU has exclusive competence. Now, nobody has ever raised major problems with treaty making. I think treaty making normally is problematic in mixed situations. I got even more depressed when the solution to this is mixity, because uh, actually it's normally mixity that creates the problem, not so much actual exclusivity. When we have exclusivity, normally the rules of the game are, are pretty clear. So I, I don't know why you present mixity as a solution to the problems, uh, but maybe, I mean, at the end of the day, the flavor I got in your presentation is that uh, in your view, somehow, the EU is an animal that we don't know very well, therefore we should go back to the paradigm that only states are the real actors in international law. So actually you were saying even in exclusive competence, let's go for mixity. So member states will be there for the, de sorry, the union will be there for decoration mainly, but the real guys are states. Is that more or less the view or, or is, is, is there anything positive about EU being an actor in international law and contributing to international treaty making or, or is it all negative? the uh, opportunity to elaborate. Um, um, of course, there's benefit to EU participation. That's why I think it, the EU, where it can, should participate, and the member states uh, should take the, the mandate seriously to facilitate that. But if the result of EU participation is that uh, member states are pushed out of uh, the treaties, and this may mean when the EU participates that the member states are reduced to not much in the treaty system. But I think from the perspective of international law uh, 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 and the still state-centered nature of international law, uh, that EU participation should not lead to uh, member states being being pushed out. But there is, I think there's a benefit for both. both uh, 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 there's expertise from the member state side and there's certainly expertise from the EU side. And where the EU has the competence, the EU would take the lead in this scenario. It's just that the difference that the, um, I guess the internal distribution of competences is not uh, externalized and that other treaty partners aren't burdened with that, that, I would say is a matter for the EU to sort out, and if need be, through infringement actions. But um, yeah, I think there's benefit for both to, to participate, benefit from both participating. Thank you. Um, uh, so yes, please do. I'm sorry, mm. I would also have a short comment. Uh, of course, I didn't think, uh, didn't talk about the uh, paradise uh, and the freedom of the member states, but it's a fact that they still have some possibility to conclude international, or they have concluded 50 years ago, international uh, agreements by themselves. But the, the development of the EU law goes clearly in the other sense. 
from the, our decision in the ITR, it's ERTA in, in English, I suppose. Uh, ERTA case, it's clear that the fields uh, which are covered by the exclusive competence of the union cannot be anymore covered by a member only, member state only uh, convention. And in, if I spoke about the field of transports, there are a lot of examples when the former competence of member states became a mixed competence. For example, the COTIF convention, the convention concerning the transportation by rail um, of goods and of passengers, it's now since, I suppose, 99, a mixed convention. And the, the direction is quite clear. Thank you. I'm apologizing for again taking the floor because I already had ample time, more than probably was desirable. Uh, <clears throat> but I can't resist the temptation to to make two brief comments to, to Katja Ziegler, um, particularly because on those two points, my own view of, of things is at least to some extent different. Uh, in the beginning of your slides, you had as a general comment that uh, the importance of international law somehow have been diminishing, and I, I suppose you were particularly thinking about the case law of, the, of our court. Uh, <clears throat> I'm, I'm not sure. I mean, of course, <clears throat> it depends very much what you include in, in such an analysis. You mentioned a number of cases. Um, some of them were on non-direct effect. But I mean, this is classical since early 1970s that not all international agreements have direct effect. Um, and, and so the fact that, that you have some, some agreements uh, applying that idea is not necessarily, I think, proving the point. Um, and um, I think probably one should include in that analysis also cases where the court uh, refers to international rules, be it council, uh, security council resolutions, or, or be it the convention on the law of the sea, or be it the WTO agreements, and, and, and you can continue the list, where the court says that the internal EU legislation has to be interpreted in light of, and, and by by interpretation, obviously, you sometimes come to almost the same result as with direct effect. And my personal impression is that, but I can't prove it because I haven't counted, but, but I, I would guess that, that you will find more of those kind of references uh, later than if you go back in the 1970s or 80s. So, but of course, I mean, this is something one can have very different views on. Uh, the second point was on more a question of detail, but, but you referred also on your slides um, to this case, Germany uh, versus Council on the, the OEV uh, uh, thing. And um, there I, I would just say that, that if there is an exclusive union competence, then obviously there has to be some sort of union position presented uh, to international organizations to which the union is not a member because it has been for technical reasons prevented or, or political reasons. Um, so I, don't, I, I, I wasn't sitting in that case, but I don't think that my colleagues wanted to somehow um, join the debate of whether member states are competent or union is competent. Uh, it's, 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 simply, it's simply a, a case where you have exclusive competence already. And, um, and then you need procedures. How, how is the, the union position adopted? And, and the court probably wanted to avoid uh, uh, a, 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 a lack of clarity in that respect because that had been sort of a gray area. And, and, uh, and, and I think, uh, in fact, member states and the council can take comfort in, in the fact that the result of that is that you need a council, formal council decision 
so so I think one should look at that case rather from from that perspective. Just take a couple more. Yes, please. Thank you. Um, Jörg Polakiewicz from the Council of Europe. And um, I would like to thank uh, Professor Ziegler for a quite thought-provoking intervention. And um, the, in particular, also I'm grateful that so many examples from the Council of Europe have been mentioned because normally the Council of Europe does not figure or feature so often in treaties of international law um, and um, the and it's true i think what uh, she has said is it's true that the increasing over the years increasing membership of our member states in the european union and this much more integrated legal order has had quite important repercussions and i would say not only negative positive and negative but it's clearly had <laughs> impact on uh, our normative work, in particular treaty making. Um, but in this context, I would also like to stress that also on our side, we are have some homework to do in the sense that uh, the fact that the EU has all these competences, in many cases now even exclusive, is not reflected in our legal framework, for example, our statute or the rules of procedure of the Committee of Ministers. They are still based on the old idea almost the Congress of Vienna, that they are just the member states. The Union technically is more than an observer, less than a member, but certainly not with voting rights. All this, I think there is also time to, to maybe reconsider this and uh, bring it up a bit to today, to the more to the realities post-Lisbon. But to my colleague from the Commission, <coughs> The EU law can only be positive uh, effects. I would have one question to the panelists regarding one of the examples where I think EU law could in fact help overcome the stalemate. This is this famous case, uh, or not so famous, but thanks to Professor Ziegler, now known to a broader public, the Sports Manipulation Convention. Because my question to you is, I'm not such an EU law expert, but there are many in this room, and in particular the panelists. We have the case that one country, Malta, it, it's, all these facts are known, uh, they were debated recently in the European Parliament, they negotiated in the Council of Europe Convention under EU negotiating directives, so also being part of the EU team, so to speak, or the EU group. And this convention was adopted, open for signature, and now Malta, having not succeeded in blocking certain provisions in that convention, which they... I think it's also no secret, it's what is behind is the betting industry, which is a major economic source in this small island in the Mediterranean. And they don't want to, uh, to change uh, radically this situation. So now in Brussels, they basically in the council have taken the position as long as we, Malta, are not uh, behind this convention, nobody neither the Union nor the other member states can ratify because of this unity of representation. But here's my question, is this not contrary to the rules uh, of 218 that provide for majority decision, majority vote, and even the duty of loyal cooperation? After all, Malta has loyally negotiated this text under EU directives. Is this not a case where EU law can be invoked uh, to overcome this uh, this is a stalemate we have. Thank you. Just take, I'll take one more from Andres and then come back to the panelists. So, uh, Andres Delgado Castellero, Max Plan Institute of Luxembourg, thank you very much for these presentations. I had a very short question for Professor Ziegler. You, it's about the scope of the duty of cooperation. You mentioned that there was a duty to refrain from acting from the member states. And I was wondering whether you would think that that duty will also be a duty to refrain from negotiating. And I'm sorry that I'm saying that in the same thinking of the B word of Brexit, whether right now that duty is not only to conclude but also to negotiate international agreements, even though the UK seems that it's going to leave the European Union. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Cathy, 
to a round table. <laughs> have a go at um, some of that. I, can I just uh, a duty to negotiate uh, by whom? By the UK. By the international trade agreement right now. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, let me go through. So, um, um, two quick responses to Judge Rosas. I think um, I, I, I take your point that there are different ways of interaction, direct effect, and um, interpretation and conformity. I think. Uh, my argument, even though the case law may be more, have been more geared to direct effect, uh, would be that the interpretation conformity is also not going as far as it should. Of course, this is a blunt statement. One would need to look at each individual case to identify a trend. And the second point on, on the, uh, the wine, the OIV, um, my, I think the case, I, I agree with the, the bottom line that there needs to be a coordinated position. I think in this case, 218 paragraph 9 is not the right basis for this, but the, the sincere cooperation. Yeah. But the, so um, it's, it's my point here was just about the interpretation of the norm, which I think is not correct um, in, uh, in terms of legally binding act where there was soft law and the EU also not being a party to the agreement. But um, okay, um, the Council of Europe. Council of Europe question. I, I, there's some precedent that where the one member state or a few member states have blocked the simultaneous ratification process that the EU, uh, uh, that the remaining member states went ahead. And I think this would be the 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 way to go. I think it's not. Yeah, well, I think it would be problematic to say Malta and the, well, Malta is under an obligation of cooperation here, but this is not enforceable in any way. Ultimately, it's a question for Maltese constitutional law, how they, and, uh, um, and when they ratify. So I think there's no, uh, no le leverage with regard to Malta, I think from the perspective of EU law, but I think there's a possibility for uh, the EU and, and the, uh, the, the, uh, the other 26 member states to go ahead without Malta. 27. 27, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> We're not out yet. <laughs> <laughs> that was the Freudian slip. I know. <laughs> <laughs> and then, um, So the, 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 the question with regard to Brexit, is there a duty for the UK to negotiate trade agreements before they have withdrawn, before they have withdrawn in order to safeguard? Whether that duty of cooperation that you have said refrains mm -hmm. member states from acting mm -hmm. would refrain the UK from negotiating international trade agreements the moment during the negotiations as, to withdraw. As long as, as, long as it stays a, a party. You mean, oh, you know, while they are negotiating. Mm. They are negotiating and the withdrawal and then they start negotiating international trade agreements. Whether the, the duty of cooperation yeah. would not allow them to negotiate those trade agreements. Well, uh, um, I guess you could say the moment they have pulled the trigger, the duty doesn't apply anymore. But I think that, uh, I think it would be it, it would not be practical to say the moment where a member state has expressed an intention to leave, even prior to the formal notification process, that uh, that uh, it shouldn't basically get get going because the, otherwise there will be a legal gap but I think uh, I think if we t took the s cooperation literally one could come to that conclusion just a short comment on the Malta case and <clears throat> of course I'm not going to respond as to the question and <clears throat> whether the <clears throat> article 218 paragraph 9 is applicable or not and the same for the um, for <clears throat> Article 4, um, Paragraph 3, but I, 
remind that there is another possibility for Malta in such a case eh, to uh, request an opinion con on the basis of the paragraph 11 of the Article 218 concerning the intended agreement in the framework of the Council of Europe. If, and if I remember well, <coughs> Malta already tried once, two years ago, it seems, to get our opinion concerning another agreement also of, in the organization of the Council of Europe, but they, after some months, after the procedure was in course, they, yeah, they uh, decided not to continue, and they, with, and they withdrew the opinion, yeah. It was the same convention or another one I can't remember. Perhaps uh, another couple of questions or one question before we got five minutes, so please, yeah. Um, just wanted to draw the attention of uh, all the audience here on a point which seems again forgotten in the debate. Um, a mixed agreement is not a multilateral agreement. The fact that there are, there is a participation of the member states' parliaments as much as the Council and European Parliament doesn't make that a multilateral agreement. It is one agreement. Most, the vast majority of mixed agreements are bilateral agreements. The European Union on the one hand and a third country on the other hand. What is mixed? Mi mixed means only a particularly complex method of ratification. And this is not my interpretation, it's the European Court of Justice interpretation. I refer to the case, uh, so-called hybrid acts case of last year. Um, in a paragraph, the court indicates very clearly that the European Union ratifies its own bit and the member states ratify under international law their own bit. Hence, there is a mantra you mentioned the B word uh, in that country, for example, that they had ratified all the mixed agreements for the entirety. Well, that is not what I understand from the interpretation of the, of the Court of Justice. They haven't ratified for the entirety. Otherwise, we would be in a situation where the same contracting party would have two layers of complete ratification, European Union level and national level for the whole which makes no sense, and it's in contradiction with the principles of the European Union law, actually. So that cannot be right. Which brings me to the follow-up question, uh, is there a duty of ratification in a situation of a mixed agreement, which is sometimes expressed under the item of sovereignty of the parliaments? Well, there again, there's a lot of confusion in my view, because this has nothing to do with sovereignty. It has to do with a particularly complex procedure of ratification. And it is connected to the principle of sincere cooperation. And it must be so if the Commission, to my understanding, opened in the past four infringement procedures against three member states in successive different files. They never reached the court, but one reached, to my recollection, the stage of the uh, reasoned opinion. So it was serious enough. And there were exchanges of letters, official letters on that point. In the end, all the three member states concerned backed down and ratified. So they did not challenge to the point to come to the court. Was that a policy decision or fear of losing? I don't know and I don't need to speculate. But it remains the case that in the four occasions that were given to those member states to challenge that position of the Commission, they never did so. Um, as a conclusive comment on my side, this issue is overcharged by uh, ideo ideology, in my view. If it was brought back to what it is, simply a mechanics of a particularly complex phenomenon such as the European Union, we would be in a simpler world rather than in a more and more complex world, as I fear we are now. Thank you. Oh, 
I don't have a lot of uh, to respond, but I certainly agree with the last sentence. Huh? <laughs> the world should be simpler. I'm not sure whether it's the ideology or something else which um, is an obstacle to this, but of course we we are a little bit yes uh, overloaded by um, formal conditions which are perhaps not necessary. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Let me, let me just uh, thank our panel again and uh, thank those of you who, are, who asked questions and, and made comments uh, for, a, for a very good discussion. Thank you, everybody. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you.